Good morning. Scripture reading today will be from the book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, verses 22 through 36. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Before he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your holy ones see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to, of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Good morning, church. All right, uh, church, let's say again, the verse that we just read, thank you, Justin, for doing that. I know that was a long verse. A lot of times we give people five verses and you had like 14. So thank you for your willingness to do that. But did you hear what he was reading? At the beginning of that passage, uh, it actually said, listen to this. It wasn't just for the people that he was talking to there. That's God talking to us. And I pray, church, you were listening to this. You were listening to what the Holy Word just said about Jesus our Lord and how important that is for us. First, I want to thank Troy again for being such an awesome song leader, an awesome counterpart in ministry as well. Um, if you're not lifted up, if you're not just pumped up for Sunday, church, when you come together, when we come together on Sunday, it's Sunday. It's Sunday, not just the first day of the week, not just the day before we have to go back to work. Church, Sunday's so important. Sunday is the Lord's day, and not just the Lord's day that we're supposed to come and worship Him. Sunday's a reminder for us, church, a reminder of everything Justin just read for us. Thank you for lifting us up. Thank you for the songs that you sang. The last three that we just sang, one of those, so powerful in its words, and I was writing it down as we were singing, The Glory Land Way. Church, did you sing that with knowledge? Did you sing it with understanding? Did you mean what you said? I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the Glory Land Way, telling the world, church, that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the Glory Land Way. Church, how many of us, how many of us are singing, I'm in the way, I'm walking in the way, I'm walking toward the way. I cannot wait to get to Jesus, but I can't wait to tell people about Jesus either. Church, it's Sunday. It is Sunday. We're in the presence of God Almighty right now. Say amen. amen. We are with God Almighty right now as we sit in these pews. There's so much else going on in the world right now, and we get to be in the presence of our God. 
What a wonderful opportunity. We say it every week, don't we? We say it every single week we come together. What a wonderful opportunity it is for the body of Christ to be gathered together to do what he's commanded us to worship. But church, do we get it? Do we get what a truly wonderful opportunity, not obligation, not just because it's a commandment, but truly out of love and understanding, do we know and recognize the opportunity it is to sit in these pews right now, to understand with the, 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 the mind's heart that we are in the presence of the Creator Himself, the Creator who created us in His image, who breathed life into our lungs, and who gave us Jesus so that we could have heaven one day. If that doesn't excite you, if that's not something that you find anticipation in every single week, I don't know what can bring you hope. I don't know what can bring you glory. I don't know what can bring you excitement. There's a lot of things we all get excited about. I love this time of year because I'm a sports fan. My wife and I are sports fans. I love this time of year because every sport I love is on TV right now. But man, it's March Madness, isn't it? Oh, we love March Madness. Everybody's brackets near busted. I know, right? It happens. It happens every year. But if we get more excited about March Madness than we do Sunday... Church, it's time for us to think about what Sunday means. It's Sunday. I'm going to say it a bunch, not just to be redundant, but to provide reminder, church, it is Sunday. If you're visiting with us, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're here for the very first time, maybe you just stopped in looking for hope, looking for a reason, looking for something to belong to, it's Sunday. And I'm so glad you're here on Sunday. If you're watching online, it's Sunday, and I'm so glad you're here on Sunday because Sunday means so much to the body of Jesus Christ because it tells us, it reminds us of the love that our Creator has for us, that we get to go and be with Him in heaven one day because of the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus Himself in our place, that we could be forgiven of our sin. Church, don't let it go unnoticed. Don't let it go and just pass you by this morning as we anticipate all the events of the day, as we know what a busy day it is. Don't let this next hour, I'm not going to preach for an hour, I'm talking about the hour that we're together, don't let it pass you by. Don't miss it. Don't miss what Sunday is all about. We often talk about that. But church, God is not only in our presence right now, God is working in this moment right now. God's working in my heart. God's working in your heart. I pray he's working in your heart. Are you going to let him? Are you going to let him? There's so much scripture to unpack this morning, and so we're going to reference a lot. We're going to reference a lot of things. We're not going to flip to a lot of things, because if we were to do that, I will preach for an hour, and I don't want to get in trouble. So, yeah, so I'm not going to preach for an hour. Um, so I want you to go. Luke chapter 19, that's where we're going to be for the first part of our lesson, Luke chapter 19. We are going to be in the book of Luke the entire time. won't make you flip around a whole bunch. We're going to start in Luke 19 because there's another reference to Sunday here. In Luke chapter 19, we have a Sunday moment. Just like we did this morning, Troy welcomed us this morning. He started singing praises. We're all lifting up our hearts and our voices. We're singing praises. We're coming into the room. God has come into the room, right? We're all coming together to do this one awesome thing. And in Luke chapter 19, we have this moment, this very pivotal Sunday, this very pivotal experience where people come into the presence of God. God comes into their presence and there's this rejoicing that happens because they know or they feel like they know what is happening in this moment. And that's what we're going to see here and what God is doing in this moment. The change in their hearts that they're hoping to experience. Church, I hope this morning you came for a change. I hope this morning you came to see what Jesus could do for you. And in this moment right here in Luke chapter 19, people are coming together with Jesus Christ looking for that Sunday moment. There's a very pivotal moment that's happening right here. We have the, the feast of the Passover that's, that's coming at hand. It's coming up. Everybody's making their way into Jerusalem. We're going to pick up in verse 28. Let's pick up in verse 28. All of our different Gospels have different events that they have recorded that happened before this moment, but they all have this moment recorded. And it's a little bit different, but it's all practically the same. All right, but we have in verse 28, the triumphal entry. 
And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Beth, Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, Say, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks, what are you, why are you untying it? What are you doing? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it, just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owner said, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And so they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. Verse 36, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they, they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now there's different renditions to this, this moment right here when Jesus <laughs> makes his way off of the Mount of Olives and into the city. And there's different, there's different details there that we could talk about. One of those being that it wasn't just the cloaks that they threw on the ground, but some of them went and got palm branches and palm leaves and they cut them off the trees and they laid them in the road. And there's recordings of different renditions of things that they said. I loved this, this particular account, though, because of what they said. But I want you, don't, don't miss what happens here. This is a prophecy. This is something that has been taught. It has been prophesied. For years and years and years and years and years, okay? Hundreds of years, they've known about this moment, right? They have been waiting on the Messiah forever. Seems like forever, right? They've been waiting on this Messiah forever, and they know the prophecies. They know what God has promised to them. And this is one of those moments that the Messiah is going to ride in on the colt of a donkey, the back of a donkey, whatever your translation says, is that he's going to ride in. And I love the fact that it even says one that has never been sat on. Almost a prestigious type thing there, right? Nobody's ever sat on this. Jesus is going to sit on this donkey or this colt. Colt. Sorry, my, my twang sometimes gets the best of me. We're just going to say donkey for the sake of misunderstanding. Um, I'm not saying colt, all right? Colt, all right? Uh, they're going to make fun of me later for it. That'll be added to their list of things to make fun of me for. All right, so donkey, for the sake of, uh, of understanding, he's going to ride on the back of this donkey into the city. And all of his disciples, not just his apostles, all of the disciples, the ones that have been following him, the, the ones that have come out to meet him, he's done some pretty awesome things leading up into coming to the Mount of Olives, one of those being raising Lazarus from the dead. And so we have these really awesome things that people have come out to see, and they've been with him for so long. Right? And so we have disciples that are with him. And as they make their way off of the Mount of Olives into the city, he's riding, he's riding on the back of a donkey. This is our teacher, right? No, no, no. There's much more at play right here. All of a sudden, this man that they've walked with, that they followed, that they've been with this whole time, they start to throw their coats on the ground. They start to throw their coats on the ground so that the, the donkey can walk on top of that. They go and they, they cut down palm branches and they bring them and they start to lay them on the ground like this is monumentous. This is something so incredible. We've been waiting on this moment and all of these things are transpiring and it's not just that, it's their attitude. Look at the attitude they have as Jesus makes his way into the city. It's the same kind of atmosphere that Troy was helping build us up in this morning. As, as Jesus makes his way, look at this, and they said... This is verse 37, all right, verse 38, sorry. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. The king is here. Some of those say the king of David, of David the, the, the king of heaven is at hand. He's here. The Messiah is here. Blessed is Jesus. He's our king. He's our teacher. Not, it's not just rabbi and teacher anymore. They reference him as king. Our king has finally made it. 
and we're going to roll out the red carpet, if you will. The king is going to walk on that red carpet and make his way into the city. Jesus is our Lord. He's our king. That's exactly what we're telling everybody. And all of the disciples come in unison together to praise Jesus. One of our accounts says that, that they came together to praise Jesus, to raise his name so that everybody could hear. I believe it was Mark's account that said that it stirred up the people that as they were raising up praise to Jesus and, and referencing him as the king, that even the people in the city as they made their way in were caught off guard and it was like, what is the ruckus? What is going on? Anybody ever done that, that you heard like just a stirring with wherever you were at? Maybe it was at, at school or at an event somewhere in a town or, or at a festival or something and there's all of a sudden this, this unsettling ruckus that starts to happen and what does everybody do? Everything stops. Everything stops, and everybody's like, whoa, whoa, hey, what's going on over there? It might be a fight at your school. Everybody does that, right? There's some unsettling ruckus that happens. Everybody always stops, and we want to know what's happening. What is going on? And it said it stirred the people up. Not only now does Jesus have the attention of his disciples, the disciples have gotten the attention of the entire city. Think about the people as they watch Jesus come in. It's not just, oh, yeah, here comes a guy riding on the back of a donkey. Why are they throwing coats on the ground? Why are they laying palm branches on the ground? Why are they calling out that this guy's the king? They have truly, truly turned this day upside down because now the focus is on who this man is. Who is he? Why is he so important and why should I listen? You have my attention. Church, that's us. That's us right now. As we raise praises up in the building, the praises shouldn't stop right here. The praises should cry out to the heavens and they should cry out to Milton, Florida, where people are like, what are they doing? Why are they so excited? Why is Sunday so important? And they come and they find out. So we have this triumphal entry that takes place here. And Luke is one of my favorites. Um, but can you imagine this moment? Can you imagine this moment? You see, I think one of the things that we miss, it's kind of like, <clears throat> kind of like, uh, I think there was a preacher here that said it uh, a few months ago. He said that he liked, to, he liked to watch the football game or know the score before he watched the football game and then go back and watch it and then he's not disappointed and there's no, no anxiety that comes with it. I can't do that. That's, man, anxiety is what's so fun, right? So, but I think a lot of times we miss this. We miss this because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the accounts of the Gospels that tell us about all these things. We know that Jesus is King. We know that Jesus is Lord. We fully comprehended that, or we should, but they didn't. You see, we sometimes read the Bible through the lens of 2024. I want you to consider this moment if you had no idea, if you didn't know what was going on. Maybe this man has only been around and preaching for three years and he's unsettled the people a little bit. There's this new thing that's happening. There's this new ideology that's being put into place. There's this man that's been healing people and raising people from the dead and forgiving people of their sins and talking about some of these more theological things as it pertains to God and heaven and eternity. And it's caught your attention, but you're not really sure why. Read it through that lens as this all transpires and this all takes place here. Church, the kingdom is at hand. It's not just coming to church on Sunday to remember this. This hasn't happened yet. This is about to happen and they have no idea that it really is. They don't really comprehend this is about to happen, the representation of this. They have no idea what it means for them. What have they been waiting on? They've been waiting on a king. They've been waiting on a ruler. They've been waiting on Jerusalem to be put back where she rightfully belongs. They've been waiting on somebody to come, the Messiah to come, and make them God's people again. And they're going to be the people that rule the world. God's going to restore what has been lost. God's going to restore what has been lost. That's what they've been waiting on. And as Jesus makes his way in, it's like, hey... We think that this is it. This is, this is the time, right? That's what they've been waiting on. The kingdom's at hand. We're so ready for it. We're so excited about it. 
consider all of these things as they're stirred up, as they're thinking about all of this. It's Sunday. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful day. As you think about that as a follower of Jesus, maybe you're one of his disciples. Everything he's been preaching about for three years, we're almost there. We're so pumped up, right? All of you have a little bit of anxiety about lads to leaders. It's been a long year, right? But guess what? It's coming. It's upon us. It's coming. We're right here. We're, we're pumped up. We have stress. We have anxiety. We have fear, but we have excitement. And it's all, we're feeling all the things. We're feeling all the things because we know it's right here upon us. And we know it's going to be awesome. That's the feeling we have right here in, in Luke. They're feeling all the things. Can you imagine then? Jesus comes into the city. Jesus comes into the city. Everybody's so pumped up. Church, it's Sunday. Everybody's so excited about Sunday. You know what? We're all going to be together all week. We're going to be together all week. This week is going to be off the hook, y'all. Jesus is here. The King is here. We get to spend all week with him. He's going to be here all week. Isn't it going to be great? It's going to be great. Let's look at how great it was. Let's look at how great it was. For the sake of time, I'm going to reverence a few things. First thing he does, I love this, and a couple of different things, a couple of different accounts. Jesus comes and he sees the city. As he's still on the Mount of Olives, he sees the city. And he looks upon it with compassion. This is one of those moments that Jesus is going to weep. He's going to have heartbreak because he knows they're lost. But he also knows what their response is going to be when he comes to bring them salvation. Jesus has a gut check moment here. But Jesus makes his way into the city, and most all of the accounts have this one. I love this one. Jesus makes his way into the city, and where's the first place he comes? For the sake of your understanding, he comes to church. Man, it's Sunday. Guess what? Tonight, Jesus is going to walk into that church building. Not really. He's already here. He's not going to come in person. Don't want to scare anybody. But Jesus is, with evening service, Jesus is going to walk in church tonight. What's he going to do? What's he going to say? How's he going to feel? Jesus went to church, y'all. You know what he did? He cleansed the temple. He walked into church and he found something that he never wanted to find. He walked into church and what he found was a group of religious people serving their own belly. Everything they were doing was about them. They had changed everything into a marketplace, if you will. Some of them were buying and selling. It was a marketplace. But the whole attitude, the whole aura, it was all about me. Everything should be about me. I'm here to make my money. I'm here to get my feel. I'm here for the people to do what I need them to do for me. That happens. That happens. Jesus walked into a situation of religious people where they had lost all concept of what the temple was for. Because all their mind was that I'm here for me. I'm here to get what the church is supposed to give me. I'm here to get what God's supposed to give me. I'm here to, to maybe build my business up, network a little bit, right? I'm here to make my friends and my relationships. There's nothing wrong with those things, but when that becomes the main thing, then we got a problem, and Jesus walked into a problem. And so Jesus immediately comes in. They're so excited, remember? So excited. Jesus come to church with us today. And Jesus is like, this ain't church. What are y'all doing? What is this? What is it? Y'all got booths set up? Y'all buying and selling things? What are y'all doing? Y'all ain't worshiping? What are you doing? Jesus comes and cleanses the temple. Okay, that upsets a few people. All right, let's, for the sake of just all things, let's just say it was really the, the religious leaders that's not our elders, but let's just say the elders got upset because he called them out. So the elders are upset. All right? So now we continue on in Scripture, and he begins to teach. Jesus is always teaching. Jesus is always using an opportunity with a group of people to teach, and he starts to tell parables. I love how Jesus uses parables because he tries to use things that are relevant for them so that they can understand the deeper message that he's trying to send. What are some of those parables? He talks to them about being prepared. He does the parable of the wedding feast and being prepared, being ready, right? The parable of the ten virgins. Being prepared and ready for when the king calls you to the feast. 
We have parables on seeing the lost. We have parables challenging people to not just look at yourself, but your eyes need to be fixed on the people that you see. That's our theme, isn't it? Not only yours, but others also. Jesus taught multiple parables in the week that they were together that this isn't about you. You need to see people. You need to see other people because they were seeing people and they were looking right through them. They were seeing needs and needs weren't being served. They were seeing people that were lost, that were struggling, and they were just leaving them by the wayside because it was Passover time. We're here for us, right? We're here. We've come back together with family. It's a holiday. It's a vacation. He challenges them with seeing the lost. He challenges them with forgiveness. He challenges them with an attitude of grace and mercy, understanding of real sin and that we're all capable of real sin. We've all committed real sin and that we're all in need of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And even though there's many of us that have received that grace, mercy, and forgiveness, we have to be willing to extend that same grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And so we have some of those parables. Then it gets, starts to get real, real. Then he's going to tell people, he's going to challenge his disciples more than anybody, but he's going to preach and teach that he's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to raise up on the third day, and he's going to be resurrected. Resurrected back into heaven. Whoa, 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 wait, what? No, we, we, were, we were really excited on Sunday because, remember, you, you were the one that was coming to save everything. You were going to restore the lost. You were going to restore us to salvation. We were going to be who we were going to be. Right? We were going to take over the world again. No, I'm going to die. All right, this week, actually. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried and I'm going back to heaven. And then he tells them something even worse. Not only did I not come to restore Jerusalem. Oh, by the way, it's going to be destroyed. I know that's not what you want to hear, but the, the city, the country that you live in, that's supposed to be the, the, the best in the world, it's going to be destroyed. You're going to become someone's slave, possibly. Some of you are going to be killed. Church, that challenges us. It should challenge us because there's so many of us of how many of us would feel like God abandoned us if that happened to our country. If Jesus walked in tonight and said, hey, I got bad news. For some of you older people in the room, hey, uh, your grandkids, they're going to be somebody's slave. I, I hate to tell you that, but that's kind of how it's going to happen. But wait, you're supposed to love us, and you're supposed to restore us, and you're supposed to take care of us. We serve you. We honor you. We're here every Sunday. We do exactly what you tell us to do. Like, why? If we do that, why would you do that to us? It's just the way that it is. That's the world that we live in. Those are the things that are going to take place. See, it's not just the elders at the church that are mad anymore. Now the people that have been following him, waiting on this moment that he was going to restore them to prominence, are like, what are you talking about? We just laid our coats on the ground and cut down leaves because we knew you were the one. And now you're telling us you're going to leave? And not only you're going to leave, but you're going to leave us in destruction? What kind of king are you? What are you doing to us? And then he says, I'm going to come back. He says, obviously i got to die, so I'll come back. I'll come back in the coming of the Son of Man. He foretells that and what that's going to look like. And how does he try to encourage them in this moment, church? How does he try to encourage them and to reveal himself to them so that they'll have faith, they'll have true faith, and that they'll believe in him? And even though it's not the best news that they could have received, they know that he is God. They know he's going to be the one that's truly going to restore them, even though it's not going to happen the way they thought. And so he starts to preach and call himself Yahweh. I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. And we have all these statements where he's telling them, I am. 
Guys, you've been waiting on this God this whole time. I'm Him. Have faith. Take courage. Take courage, church. I'm doing exactly what I set out to do. I am God. And so he tries to encourage them with all of these things. Like Troy said a minute ago, take a deep breath. It's been a long week. It's been a long week. Go to Luke chapter 23. Beginning in verse 1, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they, get, they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked and said, Are you the king of the Jews? And he said, You've said so. And then Pilate said to the chief priest in the crowds, I find no guilt in the man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. And when Pilate heard this, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him. He was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, and Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. And arraying him in a splendid clothing, they sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Verse 13, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. Don't miss it. And the people. And said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done. Nothing deserving death has been done. I will therefore punish and release him. I'm going to do what I do, and that's going to be that. In verse 18, and they all cried out together, Away with this man! Release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And a third time he said, Why? <laughs> Why? What evil has he done? I find no guilt in him deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. And Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. And he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. This is like the most heartbreaking thing that we ever read in Scripture. There was a lot of people, religious leaders, that didn't like him to begin with. But now, church, it's Friday. And the same people that threw their coats on the ground. The same people that were hollering, Hail, Jesus, King, Messiah, our King is here. We're so excited are now saying, Crucify Him! Kill Him! <laughs> Y'all were the people hollering and chanting His name four days ago. What happened? He didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. He didn't give me what I needed. He wasn't the man I thought he was. He came and he taught a lot of things. And we believed all this other stuff and he misled us. He lied to us. He led us on. What do we have to do with him now? If he's just going to die and, and go back to God and resurrect and come back one day, what need do we have of him right now? 
Doesn't fit our agenda right now, does it? When's he going to come back? Not my lifetime. What good is Jesus to me? Wait, wait, wait. Whoa. <laughs> so a man that started an insurrection in the city and murdered people. This is the guy you want? Oh, yeah. We'd rather have him free in this city than have this man speak another word. The, the man that you've been following for three years? The man you've been listening to all the words he said for three years? I don't want to hear another word he's got to say. He's a liar. He's a fraud. Off with his head. Church in four, four and a half days. The church that gathered together on Sunday to sing, I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. By Thursday, they're like, I don't want nothing to do with it. Who's Jesus? What is church? It challenges me. I hope it challenges you. Church, we haven't, been e we haven't even been able to witness. A lot of times we look at this, right? We look at this through the lens of 2024. And we look at this and say, how foolish. How foolish are they? But they were the ones that saw Jesus raise people from the dead. They were the ones that saw Jesus heal people. They were the ones that saw Jesus forgive sin. They were the ones that heard the teaching from Jesus' mouth, and even they couldn't be changed. And we think we're better. We think we're stronger. I would never do that. Church, it's Sunday. It's Sunday. Tomorrow's Monday. The next day's Tuesday. What's Jesus going to teach you tomorrow? What's Jesus going to reveal to you on Tuesday? What's Jesus going to shake up in your life on Wednesday? What's going to happen on Thursday when you're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're supposed to love me, man. What are you doing up there? Something's going to happen. Something might happen. We haven't even seen Jesus face to face. These people had, and they abandoned him just like that in four days. Friday's coming. Friday's coming, church. My question to us this morning, why are you here? I ask that every time that I get up here, and my question is the exact same. Why are you here today? A lot of us will say, well, we come to get built up. That's awesome. Praise God for that. We do need to build up. Troy, Troy has helped in, in building us up this morning with... with with awesome, energetic songs to help us focus on Jesus and to be built up in the knowledge that we have of Him. But if your only reason for coming to church is to get built up, Monday's going to be hard. Thursday, you might have a gut check moment. You see what happened on Sunday? What happened on Sunday was that in that moment, there was supposed to be a change. There was something that was supposed to happen in the hearts of people that they truly understood. They embraced it. They let Jesus into their life and they said, we know what's coming. We're prepared for it all. Let's fight the battle together. And then as Jesus unveiled that it wasn't what they thought it was because they didn't truly understand, they abandoned him one by one. Friday is coming. Today is the day of salvation, church. Today is the day of change. Today is the moment that we should all ask ourselves, do I truly believe? You see, we get lost in that in the plan of salvation sometimes is that we're like, do you believe in Jesus? Whoa, 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 back up. Even the demons believe and tremble. It's easy to believe that Jesus was real. Church, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe who He is and what He's done and what He's doing? Do you believe that God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is still working in your life right now? Do you believe that they're present in your life on Tuesday when you got something that's kind of stressful going on? Do you believe in Jesus on Thursday when your world gets turned upside down and you don't understand? When something gets challenging for you, maybe when you lose a job, when you lose a friend, maybe there's a religious conversation that doesn't go the way that you hoped. Maybe there's a moment where you realize that you've been in the wrong this whole time and there's a change that you need to make. 
Is Jesus still your God then? You see, on Sunday, it's easy for Jesus to be God. It's easy. This is the easiest day of the week. It's easy to raise up Hosanna in the highest. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. On Wednesday, is Jesus still God? Is He still Hosanna in the highest? Are you still longing for that glory land way? The only way to do that the only way to be prepared for that church is to be changed today. Today. Jesus wanted His disciples on that Sunday to be changed. And so many of them bought into something they didn't understand and went about their week thinking that everything was hunky-dory, rainbows and butterflies. God's going to put a bubble around me. He's going to protect me and we're going to get everything we ever wanted. And when they didn't, they abandoned Him and said, Kill Him. It's not our God. Church, I do not believe that the Pharisees did not think Jesus was God. I don't believe that the people following him did not think he was God. I think they all knew he was God. He just wasn't the God they wanted. Church, that's my question for us this morning. Jesus is God. Is he your God? Is he the God you want? Is He the God you desire, that you long to serve, that you long to be with one day? Because there's a Jesus that we can make up in our head and follow. But then there's the true Jesus that the Word describes and tells us who He is. Is that the Jesus that we want? Is that the God that we want? Is Christ your God? Church, it's Sunday. What a wonderful day it is to be together. I pray that we all understand who Jesus is this morning. We understand what He's done for you and for me. And the hope that comes through those things and the strength that He can provide Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. That Jesus never changes. Jesus never abandons. Jesus is always working. Jesus is always there. He's always there for us. We talked in our Bible class this morning, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And the reason Paul said that is I can do all things because Jesus gives me strength. Church, Jesus is ready to provide what you need if you'll let Him. Maybe that's salvation for somebody watching or in attendance this morning. Maybe that's true salvation and not just believing that Jesus is real, but that Jesus is God and that He died for your sins so that you could be forgiven. In that moment, that requires a change for you to say, I want to not serve myself anymore. I want to serve Jesus and Him alone, and I'm going to repent of those things. I'm going to put it behind me. I'm going to stop serving me, and I'm going to serve Jesus, and I'm going to give myself to Him in baptism and let Him clothe me and let me go out and tell the world that Jesus saves today. I'm in the glory land way. But maybe there's many of us that Sunday just kind of turns into Sunday, doesn't it? And we get real excited about Sunday. And then Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday happen. And then by Friday, we're like, yeah, I I guess I need Sunday again. I forgot. Maybe it's time to be reminded that there's a true change that needs to happen in us, not just today and not just the moment that we're baptized, but every day because Jesus lives within us and He's wanting to change us so that we can help change the world. Is that the change that you need this morning? That's my prayer today that we all strongly consider who is Jesus to me. Let's stand and let's sing the invitation song.